Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater. I'm Richard Hunt, the director of the Center for Legislative Archives at the National Archives, and I'm pleased you could join us today, whether you're here in person or joining us on YouTube. Before we hear from Professor Ellis about his latest book, American Dialogue, The Founding Fathers and Us, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming soon to the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow at 7 o'clock, 7 p.m., we honor the bicentennial of the birth of Frederick Douglass with a panel discussion on, quote, Frederick Douglass, 19th century civil rights activist, his legacy today. Douglass himself, portrayed by Phil Darius Wallace, will also appear with a panel and book signings will follow the discussion. And next Wednesday, October 24th at 7 p.m., we will host a panel discussion with the United States Association of Former Members of Congress called, quote, Catch the Wave, Voter Disconnect, Discontent During Wave Elections. In a wave election, parties suffer a dramatic turnover in congressional membership, which typically results in a change of party control of one or both chambers of the Congress. A bipartisan panel of former senators and representatives who themselves either entered or exited during one of those waves will discuss their experiences. Check out our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates about other National Archives programs and activities. Another way to get involved to support the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports the work of the agency, especially in education and outreach programs. Check out its website, archivesfoundation.org, to learn more about the Foundation and to join online. Now to today's program. Joseph J. Ellis is one of the nation's leading scholars of American history. The author of nine books, Ellis was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Founding Brothers, The Revolutionary Generation, and won the National Book Award for American Sphinx, a biography of Thomas Jefferson. His in-depth chronicle of the life of our first president, His Excellency George Washington, was a New York Times bestseller. Ellis's essays and book reviews appear regularly in national publications, such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal. His commentaries have been featured on CBS, C-SPAN, CNN, and PBS's NewsHour, and he's appeared in several documentaries on early American history. Ellis has taught in the Leadership Studies program at Williams College the Commonwealth Honors College at the University of Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke College, and the United States Military Academy at West Point. We are pleased that Professor Ellis chose to join us today. As he notes in the preface to American Dialogue, his ability to recover the voices of the founders was, quote, wholly dependent on the vast archives of letters and documents they left behind. And the National Archives is proud to be one of those vast archives, holding a significant volume of the founder's documentary legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joseph Ellis. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. I apologize. Uh, for being in my travel garb, I came straight from the railroad station and didn't get a chance to put on a fancier dress, but I can see that that's not going to upset too many of you either. <laughs> um, um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the founders and us, and um, I want to talk and not read to you. Um, fond hope is some of you might actually purchase this book and then read it, but um, you, you don't need me to be um, doing that. Um, it's, um, it's a book that is doing something that historians are not supposed to do. And I am a card-carrying historian. I mean, a PhD and all that stuff. And um, uh, we're, we're supposed to be capable not of objectivity, mathematicians and scientists, yes, 
but of something called detachment. We're supposed to separate ourselves from the present and go back to the past, which is a foreign country, and visit it, and bring the kind of the approach that anthropologists, we do through time what anthropologists do in space. So you don't want Margaret Mead to go to uh, Samoa and or New Guinea and sort of ask the uh, inhabitants, how, you know, have you ever heard of uh, Dr. Spock for child rearing? And, um, uh, and so we're not supposed to go back to the past with questions from the present. That's the sin of presentism, which historians aren't supposed to commit. The truth of the matter is the past is a vast place with, filled with things that are lost, forgotten, dead. History is what we choose to remember from the past. And we cannot avoid remembering now in the present. And it is virtually inevitable then that consciously or unconsciously, mostly unconsciously, we bring our own convictions back to the past with us. Um, and now I'm going to embrace that um, a bit, or not more than a bit, and go back to the past and to the founding era with some of the questions that seem to be hitting us as Americans at this moment, in this troubled time of the 21st century. Um, give you an example of what I mean by unconscious presentism. A Pulitzer Prize winning uh, biography of Andrew Jackson was written by um, Arthur Schlesinger in 1937. And he went back to look at Jackson and guess what he found? FDR. Andrew Jackson was really the first New Dealer um, uh, and so that it is, even though detachment is a worthy goal, um, it is probably unattainable. So, I, excuse me, I want to go back, and I'm saying I'm not going to read, but I'm going to do this. The questions that I will be carrying back to the founding from our sliver of time in the present are inescapably shaped by our location in a divided America that is currently incapable of sustained argument and unsure of its destiny. We inhabit a backlash moment in American history of uncertain duration. Our creedal convictions as Americans, all of which have their origins in the founding era, are bumping up against four unforeseen and unprecedented obstacles um, and these are the emergence of a truly multiracial society, and we're having a very difficult time with living with that, the incoherent, excuse me, the inherent inequalities of a globalized economy, which has created for the first time since the Gilded Age, now we're in a second Gilded Age, a fundamentally unequal society. It's ironic, the first middle class society in, America, in the world is invented by America we no longer are a middle class society. We have the highest degree of income inequality of any advanced democracy in the world. People don't like to talk about that, especially on the right. That to me is the defining, one of the defining issues of our time. Um, we're also coming against the sclerotic blockages of an aging political architecture and the impossible obligations facing any world power once the moral certainties provided by the Cold War vanished. Politically, I'm suggesting that if the founders could somehow come back, and they can't, they are all busy being dead. <laughs> we have not invented a time machine. They cannot come and talk to us. People used to say to me when I was on the road for a, for a Washington biography called His Excellency, it was during the Iraq War, what would Washington do about Iraq? He wouldn't know where Iraq was. <laughs> well, press, well, what would he do? What would he do? Well, somehow if you could, by miracle, bring him back, and then you could brief him on the last 200 years of American foreign policy, and then put him down and look at what's going on in Iraq, I think he'd say, how did we become the British? Which is 
an insight into the problems that uh, any anti-imperial country, the United States being founded as an anti-imperial power, is going to have as a superpower. Um, okay, those are, those are the, the questions I'm going back to. And the, the way in which I'm gonna, I, I do it is to raise questions like this. What did all men are created equal mean then, and what does it mean now? Did the term pursuit of happiness ever imply the right to some semblance of economic equality? Does it now? Who was included in we the people then? Not that many people. Uh, who is included now? You know, when the uh, candidates for the Supreme Court, we recently observed the Senate Judiciary hearings and a very controversial candidate, um, they often mimic the words of uh, Chief Justice Roberts when he was up for appointment. And he said, look, I'm just an umpire. I just call balls and strikes. Well. Baseball didn't exist in 1787, and the strike zone has expanded considerably. Women, Native Americans, African Americans, people, with prop people without property, none of those were included in We the People in 1787. Um, did the founders leave a legacy of government as us or them? If the answer is both, and it is, which of those two legacies is most relevant for us now? Given our current condition as a deeply divided people, I say, my hope is that the founding era can become a safe place to gather together not so much to find answers to these questions as to argue about them. Indeed, and that's one of the things we can't do anymore. We can't argue. We're all in our apps and our bubbles. Indeed, if I read the founders right, the, their greatest legacy is the recognition that argument itself is the answer. So in the same way that the founders went back to the Greek and Roman classics, to th Herodotus, Thucydides, Tacitus, um, Plutarch. I'm going back to Washington, Madison, Adams, and Jefferson, our classics, um, and asking you to join me in an engaged conversation about what they mean. Um, to give you a preview, or give you a, some sort of, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Jefferson than anybody else here, because you can't do everything. And I'd like to end after 20 minutes, no more than that, and open it to questions and allow you the time to come at me with whatever questions you've got. Um, uh, Jefferson is the guy for race. Put that aside. I'll, it's, we're going to look at that more closely in a second. Adams is the guy with economic inequality because he is the one founder. He's my favorite founder. His stock has really gone up. I'd like to believe some of it has to do with what <laughs> I've read. But McCulloch probably has had a greater impact than I have. And the HBO documentary, it, it does that. the single most important thing is all his papers are coming out, especially the Abigail and John letters. He is the most candid of them all, and he's got a diary. You know, you, you look at Washington's diary, and, you, and so it's like on the day that he leaves office as president, this is in New York then, no, it's in Philadelphia, excuse me, uh, April 1796, and you want to know what he's thinking. What does he say? April. 1796, temperature 38 degrees, a day like all days. <laughs> Adams 
talks about the weather inside himself, the raging bulls. And, he, and so he's, he's wonderful. All biographers need people who tell you things about themselves in their letters and provide you with that kind of material. And, and Adams does that. There's a correspondence between Adams and Jefferson uh, in their twilight years, 17, 1812 to 1826, in which they engage each other. And Adams and, and Jefferson argue about what they call the aristoi, the aristocracy, or the few versus the many. Um, and Adams begins this by saying, you and I ought not to die before we have explained ourselves to each other. They really are the north and south poles of the American Revolution. Um, and they disagree fundamentally about what the revolution really meant and, and how they'd all been shaped by it. Both of them been shaped by it, but they, they fundamentally disagreed. And Adams insists that the same pattern that has always afflicted European societies for the last two millennia will afflict the United States. We will eventually become a society dominated by a wealthy class. And that in Europe it will be somewhat different because it's titled tinseled aristocracy. But in the United States it's going to be based exclusively on wealth. And that that's inevitable. And once you get that, the wealth will be used by the top people to control the government. And you'll get a plutocracy. And once it's in, it's going to be hard to change. He predicts the Gilded Age. Um, and so he's extremely relevant for us because we're in the second Gilded Age. And if you if you graph income inequality from 1880 up to 1930, it's like this. And then in 1930, it starts down and goes steeply down. The big reason is the Great Depression. <laughs> Everybody's losing money, especially the people at the top. But then the New Deal kicks in, and about 1939-40, it levels off. And it stays at that level from 1930 till 1980. This is the golden age. This is when the middle class is, recovers its, its robust character. It starts up again in 1980, and it keeps going. And in 2008, it passes the high point that it had reached in 1928-29, and so that there's greater income inequality in the United States now than there ever has been. The top three hedge fund managers make that more than all the kindergarten teachers in the United States. And the most recent piece of legislation passed by the Republican Party adds $1.8 trillion to the national debt, a huge amount and distributes that $1.8 trillion so that 82% of it goes to the top 1%, amplifying the economic inequality. Again, the American dream is dead for about 50% of the population. This is intolerable. Um, Adams doesn't have an answer. The answer that he has, he has a couple of crazy answers. Like he has an answer, when he's vice president, he recommends that public figures be given titles, like the king, uh, the George, I mean, excuse me, George Washington be called His Majesty, and so that it will amplify the significance of public service and it'll attract people there. It's a stupid idea. They call him, as a result, they laugh at him, call him His Rotundity. And um, <laughs> he also says, well, we'll keep the, re the wealthy people in the Senate. They won't we'll ostracize him in the Senate. Well, that's a powerful place to put them. And um, uh, he really has no answer. What he does say is what's not the answer. What's not the answer is to free the market further. What's not the answer is supply-side economics. What's not the answer is trickle-down economics. It will Capitalism, by definition, produces inequality. His source on this is Adam Smith. 
He likes the Scottish writers more than the French Enlightenment. Jefferson likes the French guys. He likes the Scottish guys, because they emphasize the role of emotions more than the French. At any rate, I think Adams is a person to focus our attention on the conditions we have and what we're really up against. Um, there are a lot of other books coming out these days. All these historians or people that write history uh, are going back. John Meacham has a good book called The Soul of America. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin has a good book, one that I recommend both of them to you, on leadership. Um, most of the other people are more optimistic than I am. Um, that is, they think, you know, Meacham thinks that the better angels of our nature are coming to rescue us. I look at the internet and I don't see anything but ugly angels. Um, and in Madison in 51, Federalist 51 said, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government at all. Um, so my, uh, my last line is the last line of Tocqueville in Democracy in America. I'm full of apprehension and hope. Um, I move to a discussion of Madison and the law. The point of that is that Madison keeps shifting his positions throughout the 1786, 87, 88, um, and that there are no original meanings or original intentions to recover. Of course, tongues of fire never appeared over his head. There was not, no magic godlike moment. These were a series of arguments that occurred in the halls of Congress, compromises. The last thing that the founders would expect to see us retaining, for example, is the Electoral College. They thought it was, it was a mistake when they did it. It was the only way they could get through. Um, they would have thought we'd done away with this a long, long time ago. Um, Madison was asked about whether or not, you know, how long the Constitution would last, and he said, at the best, 100, he, in 1829, he said, at best, 100 years. None of them expected this thing to stay the way, it, this way. So all we need is a second constitutional convention which will, of course, be a circus and not work. Um, unless we really, oh, I won't, anyway. Um, I then have a talk, a discussion about the doctrine of originalism. And without going into great detail, if you want me to in questions, I will do that. Um, uh, it has some impact, it has some connection with the current uh, recent appointee, who is an originalist. Um, all the Federalist Society people are originalists, although they are different shades in, in, on that spectrum. Both Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are extreme originalists, more than um, Scalia. Um, but the title of the chapter is Immaculate Misconceptions. So you have an idea <laughs> where, where I come down on this. And I say to, the, you know, to the, my lawyer friends and constitutional scholars who say, well, originalism is, you know, the, it's, there's some problems there, but, you know, but I say, no, it's preposterous. It's not like okay or not okay. It's ridiculous. It's, it's a weaponized ideology designed to undermine the principles of the liberal tradition in the 20th century. That's what it's designed to do. Um, and they won't go after Brown because they know that's untouchable, but they're going to go after all everything else. They're certainly going to go after um, If Senator Collins really believes that now Judge or Justice uh, Kavanaugh is not going to do away with Roe v. Wade, I have got a bridge to sell her in Brooklyn. Okay? They'll do it slowly, but they're going to do it. Um, Finally, foreign policy, we're, the, we're in a time since the fall of the, since the end of the Soviet Union, since early, since 91, we're, we have, we've become at peace with war. And I'm, I try to understand why that's happened. It's really easy to go to war now. 
Nobody has to go. Nobody has to pay for it. And nobody has to vote for it. The president decides the other 1%, the top 1% we know a lot about, the real 1% are those women and men who are going to, to Iraq and Afghanistan, who are now killing themselves in record numbers of suicides. Um, there's something wrong when the, the beneficiaries of the affluence generated by America's dominance in the world have no obligation to serve. Um, so, and uh, I double back, if you look at the Second Amendment, and I do an analysis of, of, the, of that and how Madison made it and the passage of the Second Amendment, what was really at stake at, in, in Madison's mind, at least, and in the mind of the people that ratified, is whether or not national defense should be in the hands of state militia or a federal army. And they were scared, very scared, of what they call a standing army. And so that was the basis of the debate. The term bear arms doesn't mean own a gun. The term bear arms means service in the military. Digital study of Washington, Hamilton, Madison's papers, usage of the term bear arms, 158 times. Every time, that's what it means. The year after the Second Amendment is ratified, they pass the Militia Act. The Militia Act makes it mandatory for every male, white male, between the ages of 18 and 45 to purchase a musket and an outfit and to then serve. The real meaning of the Second Amendment is not the right to own a gun, but the obligation for national service if you're going back to a real originalism. Anyway, I think we're going to have problems as a superpower because, as if we didn't already have it, it worked for us during the Cold War because the Cold War fit an American, almost Jeffersonian model. There was us, the good guys, against the evil empire. This fits into a moralistic paradigm that shapes our decision making that we all can agree on. The, that we make mistakes within that, some big ones like Vietnam, for example. But that we've got that. Once you remove that, we have no compass. And if you thought that the liberal tradition was going to simply, this is Francis Fukuyama called the end of history, the liberal tradition is going to dominate the world now because there are no, no serious alternatives, you were wrong. Huntington was right when he talked about the class of civilizations. Another guy called Robert Putnam, who I really like his stuff, uh, wrote a book called The Coming Anarchy. So we're facing this anarchistic situation and we're spread out over the world and essentially we're, we're uh, aligned militarily so we're supposed to be able to respond to anything anywhere. Um, this is not going to work. When the bill on Afghanistan and Iraq comes due, it's going to be between four and six trillion dollars. And it's all going to be worthless. If you took that four to six trillion dollars, you could have redone the entire American infrastructure and stabilized both Medicare and Medicaid for the next two generations. That is a hard trade off to make in a democracy, it seems to me. I think we're fated to be a world power. Realistic assessment in my Washingtonian assessment is the United States is too big, too powerful, it's too powerful militarily. We have the most powerful military uh, force in the world ever. Neither the Roman Empire nor the British Empire at their height had the same degree of military superiority that the United States currently possesses. Um, can't walk away. We walked away once before and we know what happened between the wars, 1920 to 1940. Once we remove ourselves, the rise of Hitler, Mussolini, and Japan, and what becomes World War II, uh, plus a collapsed international economy. You can't walk away. In the, in, the, in the globalized world, there's no such thing as isolation. Um, 
So we're trapped, we're going to be a superpower, it's not going to be cost effective, and we have to make choices about what we're going to do. Any foreign policy we adopt, and we've never had a strategic decision, a strategic planning process after the Cold War ended. How come that never happened? We built up everything, you know, to fight the Russian menace or the Soviet and communist menace, and then when it collapsed, we didn't say, okay, you know, let's figure out how we scale back. There was no peace dividend, so we got caught in the Gulf War is what happened. All right, I'm talking too much. Um, I need to give you a chance. Um, and I've gone on because in a way that is beyond. Jefferson is is one of my, the most interesting characters in the book in the sense that he is, as I'll tell you right now, um, the racial question. More than any prominent member of the revolutionary generation, Thomas Jefferson lived a life thoroughly embedded in the twin American dilemma of slavery and racism. His, earlier, his earliest memory was of being carried on a pillow by a trusted, if nameless, slave. His last semi-conscious words as a dying man, a request to adjust his pillow, were mumbled to Burwell, his black manservant. When he made, when he made a formal census of my family at Monticello in 1800, he counted 11 free whites and 93 slaves, two of whom were his own children. Um, I'm, because I won't, I won't. A racial fault runs through the center of the American experience, and Jefferson straddles that divide with uncommon agility, making him our greatest saint and greatest sinner, the iconic embodiment of both our triumphs and our tragedies. Rather than side with his most ardent admirers or most acerbic critics, we need to recognize not that the truth lies in between, but that Jefferson is a fusion of both sides in their most enigmatic shape. He is the Mona Lisa of American racial history. There's a marble panel right across the way in the interior of the Jeffersonian Memorial, which contains his most lyrical tributes to human freemen freedom and equality. A new panel, we don't want to tear the Jefferson Memorial down, okay? And nobody's talking about tearing his face off of Mount Rushmore. Um, a new panel now needs to be added containing his seminal statement on our racial identity. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free nor is it less certain that the two races equally free cannot live in the same government. Nature, habit, opinion has drawn indelible lines of distinction between them. What Jefferson exposes to me, and I think if you read it to you, is how recent our commitment to being a multiracial society is. It's a mid-20th century commitment. Jefferson believed that you couldn't end slavery in his time because the only way that you could end it responsibly was to then send the freed slaves somewhere else. Initially, he thought it might be the West. Then he said, no, because that's where we're going to put the Native Americans, and those people don't get along very well. Um, thought it might be the Dominican Republic. Um, and we can't end slavery until we have the answer to that. And at some point, the answer to that was so logistically, economically, and politically impossible, it meant you couldn't talk about it anymore. Um, his view on what would happen to the free freed slave was not uniquely Jeffersonian. Most of the abolitionists thought this too. If you live in the North, you can deal with it because you can segregate them. If you live in Virginia or South Carolina, where the population is 40 and 60 percent black, it's unimaginable. And so Harriet Beecher Stowe, at the end of Uncle Tom's Cabin, has an appendix in the first edition saying, and after we free them, this is where we're going to send them. 
mostly Liberia. Abraham Lincoln meets with his with black leaders, including Frederick Douglass, in 1863, right after Gettysburg. He says, okay, if we win this war now, get ready to go. And I'm sending a special executive committee of five people to Panama. We're already going to take Panama and, uh, uh, as a possible location. Um, so when we get a demagogue who plays the race card up, which we got, you used to be able to have to play it down. Now you can play it up. It's speaking to a significant American constituency that has never come to terms with the full implications of the civil rights movement, and guess what? Never will. Um, King said that the arc of the moral universe tends towards justice. And let's hope he's right. Unfortunately, this is not the moral universe. This is the United States. And the real pattern isn't this. The real pattern is this. It's upward, but there's always a downward dip after a improvement. In other words, after Barack Obama, you could put your money on Donald Trump because there's going to be a backlash. Because there's a significant number of people who could not imagine a man that looked like that was their president. He never did receive a majority of the white vote either, even though winning both elections handily. Racism is here to stay. It's right in there. We'll, it's like cancer. We're going to improve. We're going to make improvements. We're never going to cure it. OK. A more hopeful note to end on. <laughs> um, this is a reasonably informed audience, I presume. All right, I'll give you the easy question and then the tough question. Who wrote the Declaration of Independence? Thomas Jefferson. Now, they're, believe it or not, there are historians who don't agree with that. Um, there are some historians that say it was written by the, the Second Continental Congress because about 24 or 5% of it was redone or, 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 uh, or eliminated. Uh, God rest her soul, Pauline Mary used to make that argument. But I used to say, Pauline, yeah, but he did write the magic words. We hold these truths. All right, it's not wrong that he puts author of the declaration as the first thing on his tombstone. He knows. That's his ticket. All right, tougher question. Who wrote the Constitution? Adams? Madison. Madison. Madison's the best possible good guess, which obviously means it's wrong. <laughs> Madison is called the father of the Constitution. Although in the, con he writes, he does, he prepares the, the convention with the Virginia plan that serves as the, the agenda, and then he defends it in, as Publius, and then he actually writes single-handedly the Bill of Rights. By the way, they never call it the Bill of Rights. You know when it gets to be called the Bill of Rights? FDR. They just call it the first ten amendments. By the way, he didn't think they should be at the end. He thought he should corkscrew them in. Then he couldn't do that, so they put them at the end. By the way, he didn't believe they mattered. He said it wouldn't make any difference. Democracies, Democratic republics will violate these whenever a majority wants them to. These are only paper things, but I've got to do it in order to appease the people who wanted to see a Bill of Rights in the original document. That's what he said. Jefferson says, no, these are really important. He says, no, nah, you're delusional. Um, all right. Does anybody in the room ever hear, has anybody ever heard of Governor Morris? Yes. He's the guy. <laughs> Governor Morris is a tall, 
He's the same height and build as Washington, except he has a peg leg. You can go see Governor Morris's torso <laughs> outside the Richmond Capitol because there's a Washington statue done by Houdon, the great French sculpture of Washington. The head is Washington. He had a face mask of Washington. But he went back to Paris and he had to do the body and by then Morris was serving as American minister to France and he said, you're the same size, I'll do your torso. <laughs> Morris was the kind of guy that he was famous for his wit and his somewhat uh, risky way with other men's wives. And, um, uh, and he said, and I tried to speak this to Richard earlier and I couldn't get it right. He asked me about the Constitution and he said um, that he took it, he said other people often take their wives for better and for worse, but I took the Constitution knowing the worse. Um, he, the, his biggest regret was it didn't have an article putting slavery on the road to extinction. What did he do? He rewrote the whole thing on three days in September. There was a committee called the Committee of Style and Arrangement. Every state had a representative. That meant there were 12 people. Madison was on it. Hamilton was on it. They delegated the task to Morris. And Madison later said he was the guy, and he really liked the way he ended up doing. He put paragraphs together, gave it the polish and shape it has. But this is what the draft that he was working with said at the beginning. We, the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, they didn't put Rhode Island in because they weren't there, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, then down the Atlantic coast. We, the people of the states, he just changed it. There was no debate. He was sitting by himself. He did it. We, the people of the United States. Since the whole argument throughout Philadelphia had been about whether or not the states or the federal government were the sovereign source of power and authority, he declares it's the federal government and we are a collective whole independent of our existence in the states by himself. And I would like to argue and I'll end on this note, that Jefferson's words are magic and forever, and they locate sovereignty in the individual soul. They lead to a kind of libertarian philosophy, and God bless it. Two of my boys are claimed to be libertarians. Morris's words go the other way. Morris's words say that we're part of something larger, a collective. Um, and it's the reason why, and Adams would agree, that Adam, that's the reason Adams made Massachusetts a commonwealth, and in Pennsylvania copied that, and Virginia copied that, and Kentucky copied that. Those are the commonwealths. So in our time, I say, and I think I'm stealing this line from Theodore Roosevelt, more than ever before, we rise or fall together as a single people. And our collective interests have to take precedence. We have to be think about what our responsibilities are as well as our rights. Um, and that side of the dialogue, responsibility collective, is something we desperately need. In my judgment, it's going to be hard to get. The forces are reigned against and are embedded and powerful. You have to, so in some sense, one of the points of my book is you've got to know what you're up against. Um, I think that the way it's going to happen is crisis. That's what created the leadership of the revolutionary generation, a crisis. They made a choice. Our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They couldn't turn back. Leadership was unavoidable. When Washington left Mount Vernon, he knew if he lost, he was never coming back. Yeah, and he was losing everything. They would take him to London, hang him, cut him up, put his head on a spit. He knew that. Um, I think we're going to need that, and 
the Lord or Providence or something is going to deliver it. It's going to be called climate change. And it already is called that. And it's, co it's coming. Everybody thinks it's a hoax. Think what you will. Climate doesn't give a damn what you think. It's coming. And when it comes, and as the coasts begin to have to be evacuated, we're going to have to act as a single people. You can see it now in the, in the early you know, the, so the responders to crises. When they're rescuing somebody off the roofs of somebody in Houston or Panama City, they don't care whether they're Hispanic or black or white or male or female. They're there as Americans. We're going to have to get there. And that's probably, in my judgment, the way we will. Thanks for listening. <laughs> you have many teachers have told you they're going to leave plenty of room for questions, and then they don't leave as much as they <laughs> promised to do. And I just violate. I'm an old teacher, and so forgive me for that. And, um, but I do want to uh, provide you an opportunity to ask questions. And there are microphones over here because this is being sent to the outer space or someplace. And, um, and um, yes, sir. Uh, hi, Professor uh, David hi. Balducci. Uh, you've given us a lot to chew on. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what you think or the founders would have thought. I've heard some say that the court, the Supreme Court, takes on a lot of issues because Congress has passed the ball to them. Yes. They haven't taken on those issues. Was it the right of the Founding Fathers uh, to have Congress take on those hard issues, do you think? That is a splendid question, sir. And I, I happen to have given it considerable thought uh, because I wrote a piece on it for the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago. And the answer is the Founders never believed the Supreme Court would be supreme. Um, the founders didn't think that the final decisions on the direction of American foreign policy would be made by a body as far removed from popular opinion as the court was and was intended to be. Um, and what's happened since the middle of the 20th century, starting, I think, with Brown, and first a liberal wave of legislation and now then a conservative wave, which we're still in, um, that the court has become the ultimate arbiter of American domestic policy. And that's the primary reason why everybody agrees, and Trump himself has said, that the single most important power of the president is to appoint Supreme Court justices. The founders didn't want it that way. This is, this is not Republican. They wouldn't say dem Democratic. They were Republican. And remember the word republic, res publica, things of the public. Um, the public's not the same thing as the people. The, peop the public is the long-term interest of the people, which at any given moment most of the people don't fathom. Um, but your question is very well taken. Um, and now that the Supreme Court has become so conspicuously and inalterably politicized, its prospects of in any way living up to the mythology of a group of elders that levitate above partisan politics and have some connection to divine truth, that's gone. That's gone. And gone with the proverbial wind. And uh, so um, the proper answer is the Congress needs to start doing its job. Um, right now, it's a plutocracy. And, uh, the, real, the people that represent us in Congress, their constituency is often not their voter. It's their donors. And um, it's going to be hard to change that. The worst Supreme Court decision in modern times, second and worst after uh, Dred Scott, is Citizens United. But there it is. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, you brought up the Electoral College. Yes. Uh, what do you think of the proposal to effectively abolish it through an interstate compact? It seems to be pretty well thought through with clauses like you can't withdraw on short notice and things like that. You mean uh, giving the states the opportunity to only to recognize only the pop somehow make 
a sufficient number of states make it popular? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, what the, the argument is the states have the plenary right, which is a legal term, and I'm not a lawyer, yeah, to choose yeah, their electors. Yeah. And if 270 electoral votes are decided right. by states that look at the total popular vote, then effectively you've gone to a popular vote. That's right. I'm in favor of ending the Electoral College any way you can do it. Um, I still think it's likely to require a constitutional amendment, which is extremely difficult to do. Now, the founders intended that, but um, they almost did it in 1913 when they, remember 1913 they ended, this, they made Senate election, direct election instead of legislative. There was under consideration at that moment ending the Electoral College too. Um, Half the people in, in, in uh, Philadelphia in, in August of 1787 were in favor of popular election, but they couldn't figure out logistically how you could do it. Um, you had to count the votes. Um, there's always going to be a big state, small state uh, argument about that. I mean, think about this. North and South Dakota have four senators. That st the population of both states is a little over half of L.A. It's crazy. But you can bet your bottom dollar that nobody in North and South Dakota is going to vote against the Electoral College. Um, and the same is true in all those states like Wyoming, my own uh, Vermont, um, a lot of, and many Midwestern, well, anyway. Um, what I've read about the, the other alternative, the state-based proposal, is there's reason to worry that it won't work, that, that, that it can be sabotaged easily. Um, but I don't know enough about it to, to disagree. If that's the only thing going, let's try it. You know, um, I'm willing to, we've already gone through two presidential elections in this century in which the Electoral College was at odds with the popular vote. The most recent one in a big, big, big way, by three million. So we got us. I mean, I think it's it's a no-brainer. But again, if you live in Rhode Island or South Dakota, you think differently. Uh, and um, um, I don't can't, I, I I have to stop there. Yes, sir. You mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, a second con constitutional Congress. Uh, most liberals these days are opposed to that because they figure, given the right wing state houses would appoint the delegates, oh. it would actually be a fairly malignant group which would wipe out social programs, abortion rights, et cetera. Realistically, the first constitutional Congress, those were fairly. Don't you mean the convention? The convention excuse me, itself. Yes. yes. Okay. Those were fairly elitist That's right. too, but it turned out to be relatively benign versus malignant. Why did the first one come out reasonably well, whereas we don't have the same hope for the second? Because tongues of fire descended upon them in those moments. And, um, uh, boy, I've written a book about this called uh, The Quartet that deals with some of that. And I'll give you the short answer here. Like, but the short answer is, in 1787, the total population of the United States was 3.9 million. Democracy hadn't evolved to the point that it would under Jackson. It was still an epithet. A presumption that elites were appropriate as people to listen to and to vote for still was very much there. Of the 55 delegates in Philadelphia, 35 of them were former officers in the Continental Army who had experienced the problems of the Confederation face, face up during the war, and they knew what they, they needed to have a stronger central government. It was total secrecy. You couldn't talk to anybody or give reports to the press. It was all white. It was all male. And that's the reason it worked. Think about now. <laughs> it can't be all white. It can't be all male. Um, it's 330 million people that, it, that it's trying to govern. It's a total continent. In other words, 
the very things that we would now regard as ridiculous limitations on such a gathering, holy uh, secrecy, how long do you think any secret would last? The, the conditions that allowed the first con the Constitutional Convention to work are the very reasons that are, are because it's impossible to imagine them again would make a second constitutional convention virtually impossible to bring off. Um, but you know, like, I don't know about you, but as I walk around in, in my latter years, almost everything that I think we need to do is impossible. But I think the leadership in the future is not gonna come from mainstream American politics. After all, who in his right mind is gonna run for office anyway? You gotta be nuts. Um, and uh, Martin Luther King could have never won elective office. Um, so we, it's going to come from other places. And, and we'll, we'll reach the decision to really make a kind of new, it might not have to be a whole new convention. You know, we could do something like after the Civil War. We can do five or six amendments and revisions. Um, that's possible. I don't see us getting to that point until we're really in a crisis. Trump is bad news as far as I'm concerned, but he's not a crisis. He's a comet that's gonna burn up in the atmosphere. The conditions he, that make him possible are a, a, a worrisome thing. Yes, ma'am. Oh, a former student of mine, there she is, all right. <laughs> Rebecca, how the hell are you? Yeah, I was going to give a disclaimer for the audience. I'm uh, slightly biased. I'm a former student. But um, so I like all of your books, of course. Um, well, you were required to. You only got an A because of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have only read the preface of this one um, so far. I do think that it is going to be my favorite, which leads to my question. So there is... Um, a self-conscious um, element to it about like what the founders do for us and I really like that so I was wondering how have your books evolved since um, Founding Brothers or American Sphinx and um, if they haven't evolved then why not? <laughs> Thank God they have Rebecca. <laughs> As I've advanced in wisdom, age, and grace um, uh, I, I haven't changed, but the chapter on Jefferson is, more is tougher and critical of Jefferson more so than the earlier book I did, which was itself not, you know, laudatory, but it was, um, I, as the race question has become more and more central to my own way of thinking, if you look through the racial window, Jefferson's not going to look good. There are other windows to look through. If you're looking at religious toleration, he is great. You're looking at architecture, he's got something to say. You're looking at wine tasting, he's good at that. And, um, um, but um, and, uh, on the race thing. And I think that, that you know, you're, yeah, as a former student, you know, like I, when I retired from Mount Holyoke, that was four or five years ago, and I then taught at a couple other places for a year or two, as you know, just to keep my, myself alive. And I miss it, I miss it, I miss you guys. I don't, meet, I don't miss grading your papers, however. Let's see if I remember. You wrote a paper, the last paper you did for me was in a course called Back to the Future, and you wrote about whether or not books would be alive at libraries in another 50 years. Is that right? There you go, there you go, okay. I think that I asked myself what the heck I was doing for 40 years as a teacher trying to communicate things to people like you. And if all I was doing was getting them to understand the differentness of the past, that wasn't really very impressive. There must have been some connection between what you learned and the way the decisions you make in your life. And I was just saying this to Richard, uh, one of the things, I don't know whether I gave you my lecture on this before you left, but you know, I said, all the big decisions that we have to make, you know, like the calling that we have as a profession that you just decided about, who you're going to marry, man or woman, um, we have to make all those decisions without knowing enough to make them well. 
for as well as we'd like. Later on, oh yeah, I should have done that, you know. And, um, um, and history expands your memory and back in time. And if I didn't believe that, then I, I, mean, I must, that must have been driving me as a teacher. And anyway, if that's what I really believe, I need to write a book that does that, okay? And I need to be forthcoming about my own convictions, but each of the then chapters is still, you know, I've read the papers of Jefferson, I've read the papers of Washington, I've read the papers of um, Adams, I've read most of the papers of Madison. So I'm grounded, you know? I'm not just going back to cherry pick, you know, like people go back to Jefferson and say, Jefferson was an evangelical Christian. I'll find it. If you tell me what you want to find, I'll find it for you, okay? <laughs> Uh, but Jefferson wasn't an evangelical Christian. He wasn't an evangelical, he wasn't even a Christian. He believed that Jesus was a neat guy, like Socrates. And when, when he, Jefferson, died, he wasn't going anywhere but into the ground. That was it. But um, at any rate, yes, I think I grew, and I think that some of that is in the book, and I think my attempt to connect then and now con consciously and explicitly is, is a statement. And that was a struggle. That was a struggle. But if you're not struggling, you're not growing. Remember that. <laughs> We're going to take one more, and then I'm going to, I'm going to let, you, let you go to lunch. Yes, well, ma'am. You may have hinted at the answer to my question a few minutes ago. But if uh, Barack Obama's election and tenure v virtually guaranteed a Trump, what hope can we expect from the Trump election, and when might we? See <laughs> oh wow! Um, I, I was exaggerating, I, but the election of a of a black man guaranteed a, a backlash, and Trump became the form of that backlash on the racial front. What can we expect? I think that there's backlashes to backlash. We are going to discover in about two weeks whether that is what's already happening in what are going to be the most important midterm elections in my lifetime. And I'm worried. I know the Trump people are turning out. The Kavanaugh thing has increased their ardor. I still don't know about the millennials as include my kids um, and some of the racial minorities. Um, the big number in 2016 was 47. 47 percent of the people never voted. Think about that. Um, and in midterms, like 65 percent of the people don't vote. If we get a 50% turnout in a few weeks, it's going to be the end of Trump. Or it's going to be the election of a Democratic majority in at least one house. Um, and that will eventually impose limitations. And from a strictly conservative point of view, balanced point of view, that should be something that most Americans want. Things are totally unbalanced now in terms of Republican domination. Um, but if you follow the pattern, every backlash is followed by an upward curve. Um, that's what Meacham and, and Doris think is going to happen. Another, another progressive movement. It won't be called the progressive movement. It won't be called the New Deal. It won't be called the Great Society. We'll call it something else but it'll be in that tradition. I'm less sure about that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> Folks, just a reminder, there's a books, uh, book signing right outside the door in the theater lobby. So please join us in a few moments out there. <laughs>